role today in terms of kind of helping us uh, and, and sharing his insights in terms of the in the discussion period uh, after John's uh, remarks. Uh, Howard, as I think many of you know, is a former congressman from Michigan, has uh, played a, a role in the Clinton administration as Special Ambassador of the Great Lakes in the 90s and is now very active in DRC and Burundi and Liberia in many of these same issues in terms of uh, leadership training and capacity building and particularly with a focus on conflict prevention. So we're very fortunate that, that um, Howard is able to join us as well and we won't we won't make him uh, work too hard, but we, we appreciate his um, uh, joining us here today in part because he's just spent the better part of a month in, in DRC and following the, the politics around the election. So um, we're thrilled to have him here today and, and his leadership here at the center in both the Africa program and the uh, leadership and state capacity building program that well, was, made it possible for John to join us. So John, I think I'd like to turn the, the floor over to you for presentation and then we'll have a, a Q&A. Um, and when we come to that Q&A, I ask that you uh, wait a moment with your question until one of my colleagues gets to you with a, with a microphone. We are webcasting this meeting live and then we'll have that video archived and so we want those folks to hear your questions as well. So when the time comes, if you could let us know who you are uh, on the microphone, that'd be terrific. So John, please, the floor is yours. I thank you very much, um, Geoffrey, for the introduction that you have just made. Um, it is my pleasure and my honor to stand before you and share uh, some of the insights on my country. Your presence in this room is an indication that that's how I read it. It's an indication that finally our country is coming now to the map of the world and people are now getting interested in what is happening in the country um, because we felt for quite a long time as Congolese that we were the back banners of the world and nobody cares the media coverage was quite insufficient uh, in the view to the magnitude of uh, the disaster that was happening in the Congo. Um, for those who were, were slept late yesterday, I'm sure if you tune to CNN, there was a lengthy coverage on what is happening in the Congo and the program had a title known as the, the Killing Fields and there was they were in concomitantly broadcasting situation in the Darfur in Sudan but also in the Democratic Republic of Congo especially in the eastern side of the country so for those who are late sleepers most probably they must have what I will be talking about right now. Uh, the title, as I said, was The Killing Field, Africa Misery, World Shame. That was the title. And there, was a report, there were reporters who were on site, but also some analysts were at the studio. What I will be talking about today is um, the minerals, the forest, and the conflicts in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Each of those components may constitute a whole thesis for a PhD. So you will understand if I just crush the surface of uh, the subject by trying to give particular indication on where the situation on minerals and forest are contributing to the suffering of the Congolese today. On, on this map, you can easily observe there are three of them. One, it shows where uh, Congo, the Congo is a country, and also the size of the country. They put some European map 
just pasted to the Congolese map to see that the Congo have the almost the size of Western Europe. So it's a big country. In the middle you see we have a huge forest, which is the 50% of the African forest or remaining forest. And you see the representation of wildlife on the other side, the Virunga National Park, which is one of the world heritage and it's what to call protected areas. For your information, Congo have the six, uh, five of the six world heritage sites uh, in form of national parks. And that, that gives you a glance on which country we are talking about. We are talking about 2 million uh, 350 square kilometer of size. It's the third largest country in Africa. And we are talking also about a country that has sur is surrounded by nine other countries right in the middle of Africa. Franz Fanon, who is a, uh, a writer you may know, once wrote that the Congo had, the Africa had a shape of a pistol. And he said the trigger is in the Congo. <laughs> he might have been very right. Because when we start fighting each other, we drew in our country six armies eh? from six countries. And some call it the first world war, African world war, the first African world war. So this is the country we, we are talking about. This country is endowed with so many minerals and other natural resources, waters, forests, wildlife, and all sorts of minerals you can imagine. Some strategic, some rare, some precious. They are all in this country. And from the theoretical point of view, we may say that when a situation happens uh, in a violent form, like the one we lived in the Congo, it is an indication, it's just a symptom of the inability of the existing structures and institutions in the country to regulate the various demands of the people within the country, and also demands that are coming from outside the country. If that inability exists, it weakens the institutions. And by the fact that the institutions are weak, it's also an indication that the processes that brought those institutions to be were the processes that were flawed or characterized by either exclusion or marginalization of sections of the people within the country itself. And because of that situation, then you have the result of weak institutions, whereby finally leaders are playing a major role in the country without particular legitimacy. At the end of the day, we have the leaders who are playing their own game against the communities and the people uh, in the country. Well, that's precisely what happened in, in the Congo. But the processes of decision making or even selections of those who will be animating the institutions is also embedded in the type of relationships that exist in that society. Uh, that, that society. Again here, as I said, if the relationships are characterized by exclusion, by marginalization, by the fact that people cannot contribute and be part and parcel of the process of making those decisions that are affecting their lives, then again, we reach a level whereby the process itself is flawed and leads to weak institutions that finally are unable to accommodate the demands in the country and then leave out the violence that we observed. That's really what happened 
in the Democratic Republic of the Congo on, from the theoretical point of view. <coughs> the minerals we are talking about, we are talking about copper, cobalt, and those we found in Katanga province, Katanga province in the southeastern of the country. Then we have diamond. In the Kasai, it's in the middle of the country, and northeastern province, Kisangani area, you remember Rwandese army and the Ugandan army fought three times in that town for the control of that town. And one of the reasons was that this is an area where very rich on, on diamond. Then we have uh, Colton and Cassiterite. These are the very, uh, the very last one that are creating so much suffering for the Congolese people today. Coltan, since 1999, became the discovery in the manufacturing of mobile phones, uh, computer capacitors, and other high-tech uh, uh, facilities and devices. The Coltan has the capacity to absorb in a huge amount of, uh, of, of uh, heat, and because of that, it's appropriate in miniature kind of devices. And Cassiterite, when the prices of Colton went down, the prices of Cassiterite went up. And these two minerals are almost uh, extracted in the same area, same, they, they, they are all together. It's the same way with copper and cobalt. They are all same place, same way. So the same kind of results uh, of the suffering of the Congolese for those who were trying to access those minerals and control them is the same when the Cassiterite price went up on the international market. And it's still up, by the way, up to now. Then we have gold in the Ituri area, northeastern. There was a lot of fighting in northeastern area. In fact, in 2003, it dragged, the, the, the fighting dragged the European intervention. For the first time that the European came together and intervened in an African conflict as a unit, the opera Operation Artemis, if you can remember that operation, took place in that particular area. And the reason, again, was because the various factions were fighting to control that particular area where we have the hugest um, um, gold mine in the Congo, called the Kilomoto. The distribution of uh, minerals in deposits in, in the DRC, unfortunately the map is not as clear as one would have wished, but that's the best I, I could found. <coughs> but you can see the extreme east and upper north and slightly on the south, southeast or south middle uh, center of the Congo, is the place for minerals, minerals of all sorts. We have, as I described above, it, right down there, the southeast, the cobalt and copper, the uranium is there, the manganese, you find on that uh, area, and on the extreme, uh, in the Middle East, um, not the Middle East, <laughs> 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 of, of the Congo, that's where we find the coltan, the majority of um, uh, coltan deposit, 80% of the coltan deposit of the Congo is found there in the eastern side and also a lot of gold, a lot of cassiterite and, and manganese can be also found there. Upwards, um, the northeastern province, that's where you find gold again and diamond. In the middle, south, southwards, that's where we find the hugest um, deposit of diamond, industrial and gems. That's where we find those minerals. As they are distributed later on when we mix with the forest, you see why they concentrate themselves in the periphery rather than being in the middle. The Katanga province is the one I have put on red there, just to show Lubumbashi area. is the latest uh, report of the global witness have concentrated on that because that's where really the epicenter of a lot of corruption 
and a lot of raw deals are being carried out in, in the Congo today. Copper and cobalt that I talked about, we have some pictures there, and you can see the use. Um, for copper, Congo has the 10% of the global reserve of copper, and on cobalt we have 34% of the global reserve. And the use is there, as I said, and the description also is also um, put there, where uh, the, the cobalt can be used in irradiation of fruits and vegetables to kill the bacteria. So it's also used in the, in the food stuff, uh, used in radiotherapy also, and some nuclear weapons design, uh, possibly also carcinogenic uh, and slight toxic, uh, toxic, toxicity uh, is in the, in the, in the cobalt. About the diamond, that's the distribution of diamond in the Congo. Mbujimai is the hugest area. In fact, if you go to Mbujimai, it's a town. They, there is a huge sandboard that right. this is the world diamond town. And you go to the market, you can buy the diamond at the marketplace. It, the market is known as Vandiam, where you can trade diamond just as you can trade any other goods in the market marketplace in, in Bujimai. That's why we have also the state-owned Miba, which is uh, the biggest um, company, uh, state company that we have dealing with the uh, diamond in the Congo. Now, GDP, how these minerals are participating to, to the national GDP in 2004, the mine contributed by 10.3%. The forestry and fishery and agriculture, 48%. The rest was distributed as uh, the chart indicates there. This is one of the area, the copper and cobalt is being mined. You can see the environmental damage that is done. It's huge places, when we are talking about the concession for mining. We are talking about places where, of, of places of the size of several countries. Uh, there are people who jokes around there and say the mine that you find like in Lubumbashi, like, like four times Belgium. Or neighboring countries, name them, they say this is the concession that people are owning. Now, in terms of mining cycle, we have the international market. The international market increases the demand for minerals. And of course, companies start looking where those minerals are. And since Congo has been endowed with so many of those, they will land in Congo too. And when they start looking the mines in Congo, people get agitated and start digging everywhere possible to get uh, a hold on, mineral, on the mineral. And the, the minerals are extracted raw and, sell, and sold to uh, houses, uh, the trade, trading houses or middlemen. There are so many in the between. Who take those? In the case of uh, copper and cobalt, that was illustrated by the global witness. And that I adapted to present this this way. The raw material are analyzed in Zambia and uh, South Africa. And where that's where the primary processing is done. And then they are taken to African ports. Uh, I said South Africa and also Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And where they go to the European ports, from where they are taken to European ports, and where they finally they go to either Asia or Europe for final processing. And our final processing now it is distributed on the international market and you have the cycle. The more the demands are, the higher and the, the, the faster the cycle move. And the more victims we have in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I want to do a short digression here. It's important digression in the sense that 
This map helps us to understand why these patterns have been the same since King Leopold II. For those who have read the book of King Leopold II with Rabba, they had discovered in Europe that they could use rubber rather than using other material to manufacture tires, but also isolation of electrical wires and many other functions. So the demands, again, when I'm putting international market there, went very high, and the need to access rubber also increased, and hence they pushed the Congolese to start looking for rubber. At that time, of course, there was no plantations, enough plantation to respond to the demands that were in the international market. So the lianas that we have in the forest, you just make a small cut on it, and you have the rubber that you want. But they wanted the quantity, and they were thirst of quantity and the quantity of the rubber. And the Congolese were put on forced labor they, they, they had their, their limbs chops when they didn't reach the amount of rubber that was required. Many people were killed in the process, and that went on for almost a generation. And those who documented this, it's 10 million of Congolese who died in the process. Again, when Colton came, as something that is important and can be used in our mobile phones and our computers, the same scenario happened. The access to that minerals also accelerated the need for people to control those minerals. And since, as I put at the opening of my speech here, that when we have weak institutions, then they are unable to control and regulate the demands of the people inside the country, but also outside the country, then the doors are wide open for predatory kind of access and control for such a kind of minerals. And at the end, it's the people who are suffering again. The Coltan have killed so many. So many people are still even up today subjected to untold suffering. Working forced labor. The children are being put in pits also to, to dig, to dig the the, the, the minerals, because the demand is very high uh, on the international market. Of course, at the end of the day, the manufacturers of these devices that we all love and we all use will become richer and richer. But the Congolese will continue to die and remain poorer and poorer. That's the tragedy. I call it the deadly ping pong. When something is discovered there, it means death on the other side. And that's where you hear those kind of terminologies that this wealth has been a curse for us rather than a blessing. I, in green there, I try to explain, is to put two, uh, one and one. Uh, what is green there represents also what is green in terms of forest in the Democratic Republic of Congo. In other words, one can just draw, as looking at that map, one of the conclusions and say if we clear our forest, we likely will find what? Minerals. <laughs> so the forest has been protecting us against minerals, uh, uh, diggers. But at the same time, if we clear it, then we will not have even rain. Because the Congo has also the Congo River Basin, has the waters that we have actually in Africa. Uh, the reserve of waters that we have in Africa are still well kept in the Congo. So that place where you, the green is, is also the place, as I said, that represents roughly, not necessarily in a precise way, uh, where the, the forest is uh, located. That leads me to the forest area. We, as you can see, that's the forest of Central Africa, what we call the Congo Basin Forest. The Congo Basin Forest is huge, as you can see. But 
that forest in the Congo itself is quite protected so far. It's not exploited to the magnitude of the other countries that are surrounding uh, the Congo Basin Forest. And those countries, as you can see, is Congo Brazzaville, we have Gabon, Central Africa Republic, we have uh, the Congo itself, that are part of what they call the partnership for the Congo Forest Basin. They have a partnership that they created and that uh, the, the zone that they, they cover. Sorry. The, the Congo Basin Forest Partnership is divided in 11 landscapes. And as you can see, those landscapes are there. In Congo, they represent also what we could call the, what I said before, are also representing the preserved, the area that are protected, the national parks. Those national parks are also world heritage sites. There are five of them. Each of those parks have some characteristics that makes it unique. If you see the Virunga Park, for those who again watch the, the program yesterday on Congo, they showed how the gorilla, the mountain gorillas, are, populate, are, pop, uh, are, are populating the area of uh, Virunga Park. That's the identity of the Virunga Park. We have the Gorilla Mountain and the Silverback that are there. We, we share the same ecosystem with Rwanda and Uganda. We find the same kind of gorilla there. And then Kauzi Biega is the where you find the gorilla, the lowland gorillas. But also what we call the mountain elephants. The chimpanzees are also in, in that particular area. And then if you go up there in the Epulu, that's where we find the most rare animal we have called Okapi. Okapi is one of those animals that is a very clean animal, very, ty very tidy uh, animal. They don't eat the grass that is on the ground. And when it rains, they stand still until it dries so that they can walk. They are unique animals, it's half um, antelopes, half zebra. Uh, they, they are, I have seen them personally, I've been in that reserve. They are very beautiful, uh, even uh, skin-wise. And uh, it's like velvet, they are, their body. And, and for your information, two babies have been born, uh, baby Okapi, were born in, in August, and make it 16 now in the reserve. But the whole amount of reserve that we have in the wilderness can reach uh, hundreds. Now, all these beautiful reserves that the world have have been affected by the war that is going on. Almost the population of animals that were in the Virunga are dying. In fact, there was an outcry done by the person who is responsible of the reserve today that they are killing all the elephants that were there in the hippopotamus, <coughs> hundreds of thousands of antelopes are being killed every day by people who have gone to the forest and settled. These are groups of people who have been fighting and have refused to join the peace deal that is in the country and have settled in the forest, destroying all the ecosystem that we have today. Again, the Kauzi Biega Forest, that was the mine, the coltan has been, uh, the people have been getting coltan from the, the forest. At a certain point, 10,000 people were in the forest, digging in that forest, changing the, the route of the stream. The Congo Basin Forest contains, as I said, a quarter of the world running tropical forest. So the Congo forest is the world's second largest tropical forest itself. And it's 700 square kilometer, 
uh, sorry, uh, square miles in the six countries that I, I described. And the Congo Basin Forest Partnership, which is an initiative, you need to be proud of these Americans. This is an initiative of Americans who came up with this idea that with the governments in the region that they can come together and start looking how they can utilize this resource that has become scarce and in a, in a, more, um, in a more rational way, in a more sustainable way, so they can get benefit from the forest, but at the same time protect the ecosystem in the forest. And that the, peop the, the groups of, of countries that uh, uh, constitute the Congo Basin Forest Partnership is there, and the biodiversity of this forest includes more than 10,000 species and plants of plants, 10,000 species of birds, 400, 400 species of mammals. And I talked about, for example, the okapi that I described above, but you can go on and talk about the rhinoceros and other species that are in there. In the mouth of uh, Colin Powell, the former Secretary of State of the US, he said the forests play an irreplaceable re role in sustaining our environment, whether by absorbing carbon dioxide, by cleaning the water or holding the soil. So beyond heavy, having this monetary kind of revenue from the forest, it, it is also sustaining our survival as humanity. And the Congo Basin Forest being, now this is the threat now, they're being degraded at the rate of 2 million acres every year. 80% of the world ancient forests have already been degraded and destroyed and only 20% remains intact. The World Heritage Site in the DRC suffer more than any other forest and biodiversity site in the DRC as I explained above. These are the threats that they are the forest is suffering from logging, cleaning of land and uh, for agriculture, poaching, the bushmeat. The bushmeat is really loved by many people. By the way, if you go to a carnivore in Nairobi or South Africa, you eat game meat. You eat all sorts of meat. Uh, from giraffe to elephant to crocodile. And, and uh, by the way, you go to the restaurant to eat just meat. And in Africa, people like eating the, uh, the bushmeat, and so it becomes a big business. And by the way, sometimes in some of the, uh, some of the, the shops here in the U.S., you can buy game meat. Yeah? The mining inside the forest, as I, as I said, and settling, people s will settle and just build structures in the forest and stay there. Um, Diverting stream, cutting trees for fuel and construction, and the capture of rare species and endangered species, such as mountain gorillas, especially the babies. The babies are extremely expensive on the international market. And it's a, it's, a, it's a black market, of course. And up to $10,000 for a baby, baby gorilla. But to get the baby gorilla, you need to fight the whole clan of gorillas. In other words, it's not only the baby that they finally get, but they decimate all the family to get just the baby. So they kill all the adults to get the baby. The consequences has been, sorry, uh, that's now at national level. If you take now the consequences of the minerals on one side, and the other side, the forest, and put it at a national level. This is the impact that we get. At economic level, the hyperinflation, the depreciation, the lack of saving, the falling of production, both in agriculture and manufacturing, the collapse of infrastructure, tax harassment, because there is limited production, then the government become predatory uh, using taxes, shortage of basic items, including medicine supply, increase of price of food stuff, and essential commodities. The eradicated disease resurfaced again because people didn't have adequate health care. 
arbitrary grading monopoly to dubious operators, especially in the mining sector. The result, or on the ecosystem, people have called it an, an ecocide at the ecosystem level, the logging, the cleaning of land. I, I, where? I'm going backwards, sorry. <laughs> Fight of, uh, the flight of investors, so the investors left the country. In 2000, for example, the deficit was 120 of the government revenue. 120 percent. The collapse of the banking system, the life expectancy shrunk, uh, 42 for men, 47 for women. So most of the 42 are virtually, virtually dead. 80% of, 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 uh, 80 of people are living under one, one dollar a day, and the GDP declined. In 1990, we had 224, but in, 80, uh, in 2000, the, the GDP was 85. So you can see the, the amount of uh, disaster that the country was suffering from. In the mouth of Jonathan, he says, Demands for cassiterite has surged because of new laws in Japan and West Europe have resulted in tin replacing lead in the manufacture of electronic circuit boards. So global demand for the tin is directly linked to human rights abuse and the battle for control over the minerals such as it's a place that he went and documented where the forced labor is being done, where people are dying on a daily basis, and where the military are the one controlling everything in the area, especially in Walikale area and that particular BCA. These are some of the results that we found. Now, I need to pause here. By those social indicators, and I already indicated them, the mortality has increased, the life expectancy has reduced, the GDP have de uh, declined. I want to pause here and, and say about the responses that we have had so far on this situation. Of course, the biggest uh, consequence is the four million of people who have died and 1,000 1, of people dying every day uh, at the present moment. But people did not stay and did not do anything. They responded. And I have four areas of response. The first one was the UN and the World Bank response. The UN concentrated in the area of rebuilding the state itself, helping the peace to come back, and more so they used the peacekeeping forces to come and be there to help the parties to come to a settlement, a peaceful settlement. Then the World Bank, the World Bank came, and after negotiations with the authorities in Kinshasa, they came to a conclusion that they should not wait until peace comes for the resumption of cooperation, financial support for the country. Many people were dying, and the prospect of peace were there through the Lusaka Peace Accord that was signed by all the parties who were fighting. But the country needed uh, an economic support to move forward both the peace agenda but also reduce the suffering of the people. So the World Bank came and looked at the structures and say maybe the first the entry point is to strengthen the structures. And they identified with, the cons the cons uh, with consultation with the government of Kinshasa, two areas, the mining sector and the forest sector. And say if we organize these two areas, we'll have the capacity to control the predatory way of accessing these minerals, but also the misuse of the forest. And the potential this material, the, the, the mine sector and the forest sector have for the economic recovery is huge. So that was the entry point, and they came up 
with, as a result, two instruments. One was the mining code, and the other one was the forest code. Then people can say anything, and I, I will not dwell around that. Maybe in the question and the responses, when we look at the mining code and the forest code, how it has been helpful for the Congolese, and is it working or not working, that I think we can dis discuss when we come to question and answers. Then we have the third areas of intervention was the government of, of Congo itself. And the government of Congo they took the peace process forward from the Lusaka Peace Accord. They went to Sun City, and Sun City, they found a partial peace accord. Two fa major factions came together and left out the other one. Negotiation took place, and finally the third party, would RCD Goma, joined MLC and the government and created what they, all, they call the all-inclusive uh, um, peace agreement. And the peace, all-inclusive peace agreement saw the interim government coming with a formula that is unique in the world, where we have one president and four vice presidents, each vice president coming from a, a rebel faction or an oppos uh, an opposition, an arm, unarmed opposition. Now, moving this forward brought also the policy, the, 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 the political agenda to the elections. And this is the election that have been completed. And these elections, if they are carried out properly, then we'll see a more stable government coming in power. And having two major instruments to work with, the mining code and the forest code, that have already attracted a lot of investors. If I look at the list of countries and companies that are now operating in Congo, it's a very long list, especially in the mining sector. But if you talk about the countries, Canada is very present there, Australia, China, Zambia, South Africa, India, US, they are all there in the, minor sec in the mining sector. And this is a result of this work that was done by the World Bank and the government of, uh, of Kinshasa. Of course, we have the third category of people who also are reacting. The civil society has been very active. And civil society has been active in the area of playing the watchdog as they were implementing the structural adjustment programs the programs that were designed by the World Bank, the IMF, the civil society were also looking the impact those programs were having on the communities in the mining sector. They will identify, for example, that the mining code have left out the artisanal uh, miners. The, the artisanal miners are the engine of the mining sector today, people talk about a million, 700,000 to a million who are in the informal sector, in the mining sector. But the code did not take them into consideration in a proper way to organize them so that taxes can be received by the government and they can also be organized. And they work in very difficult hygienic conditions and also very rough way of work. So they die a lot. There is no protection that they have. And that alone is what, what the civil society is putting out and say this is not working and needs properly to be managed. In the USID, the government of, of the, U, uh, the United States government, through USID, have also made fantastic effort to bring back, especially in the area of forest, the, 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 the forest code, to bring back the assets of the state in the coffers of the state so that they can go back to the people and alleviate the poverty and help people to uh, resume a normal life. I think I have touched on what 
I brushed and I hope I give more details when we, we come to question and answers. And I'll run very quickly in the recommendations that I have. We need one to support the ongoing peace process as a matter of priority. And for me is to prepare the after elections. If the after elections are not well prepared, we may drift back to violence. In fact, the report are talking to one of the renegade colonel uh, or general uh, Nkunda who have refused to join the peace process in the Eastern Congo. Nkunda was saying, uh, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for a new government to come. If it does not come, then we offer the alternative. So I think that's an area that we need absolute support. And capacity building for members of a new government, the new structures that are being put into place, the constitution that Congo is coming up with is a decentralized constitution. For the first time, the power is being uh, given to the provinces. So we'll have structures in the province that needs capacity building, and also the structures at national level that is brand new, that will be working in a very new environment which is more democratic than the previous uh, political environments that Congo have known. Then the, the security reform sector, that's where the fear is. The demobilization was not, well proper, it was not properly done. And so people are fearing if we go to elections and do proper elections, we have new structures, but we'll have the problem of dealing with those who have been demobilized and are still holding their guns. So the security sector needs to be well uh, uh, contained. The police and the judiciary system need some reform that need to be consolidated. And then the environmental sector, we need the protection and the development of the world heritage. I explained why. The development of a regional ecotourism infrastructure. This, if we, if we put the, tu the, the tourism in the region, we make the situation regional rather than co Congo-centered uh, issue, then we reduce the likelihood for the friction between the states in the, country, in, in the region, especially the Great Lake region of Africa. Or building the capacity of selected civil society members. And then complete the support in the mining and forest, uh, uh, for the mining and, 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 and forest sectors reform. The two codes have initiated a process that needs to be completed. For example, critics say the code did not uh, think about accompanying mechanisms. So the accompanying mechanism that take into consideration the needs for the collectivity, for the people, for the communities, needs also to be completed. And as I said also, in the mining sector, the artisanal uh, part was not also looked at properly. So, and so the refocusing capacity building at national and local level, at national level, at ministerial level, targeting civil servants, a request for the creation of a special parliamentary commission on mine and forest management. That would be very good at this moment because we have a brand new parliament that needs allocation of tasks. That's why we can design the job description for them. It's, it's the time. And the new provincial and local structures. Now, in conjunction with the new government, organize an international conference for cooperation, operate, uh, I mean, operating and interested, uh, cooperation operations, sorry, it's operating and interested in the Democratic Republic of Congo, especially in the mining and forest sectors. And the objective of this conference will be to assess the progress of the mining and forest code, to agree on verifiable targets that they will have to meet as people dealing with the resources in Congo in terms of performance and returns for the, the communities. So the social program for local communities, some cooperation have already indicated their commitment and to agree on a regular mechanism for assessing progress of the above and assist the government in designing accompanying mechanism for the mining and forest codes. Accompanying laws organizing the artisanal mining sector needs also to be designed to accelerate the conversion process, actualizing the participation of community in zoning new, new concessions. Local parliament should create a commission to oversee this process with the participation of NGOs, traditional leaders, and main religious groups with substantive social activities in the area. 
I mean religious group, I, I say it knowingly. Those who doubt and want more explanation, I can give them uh, later. The Lutundula Commission, which was the commission to look at the previous contracts that were signed during the war, never been discussed. So this, the parliament, the new parliament should discuss this report as a matter of agency, appoint a new parliament commission, uh, a parliamentary commission to oversee the implementation of uh, the parliament's decision on the report and the subsequent addendum, and then reappoint the drafters of the mining codes and task them to include the pleas of or clauses organizing the artisanal sector. Uh, I mean, uh, of causes. Uh, without undermining the spirit and the letter of the codes, include accompanying mechanisms for implementation, proper implementation. Then it's, it would be good to appoint a special commission, including experts from the World Bank and IMF, to regularly review the progress and inform the public about the outcomes. Local parliament should be associated to the commission's work and as a validating board and implement the anti-corruption laws by creating a special interparliamentary commission and a special anti-corruption unit assisted by the IMF and World Bank and renowned local and international NGOs and other members of the civil society. So maintaining pressure, the civil society should maintain pressure for the respect of international and national instruments in, the, in, design, in designing a plan for long-term commitment. Long-term commitment, sometimes NGOs come, make a very powerful report and disappear. They don't care about the implementation of the report they have designed. So we need to bridge that gap. And that's the reason I'm saying they need to commit themselves on a long term. Design sustainable follow-up mechanism for campaigning, for campaign and reports. Design harmonized plan for capacity building for new, uh, of the new institutions, especially at provincial and local level. Areas of interest should include then the mining and cold uh, forest sectors, the anti-corruption strategies, budget elaboration and tracking, follow-up of implementation and evaluation of the, the budget, the strategies for tax collection and use, and the environmental management strategies. These are areas where NGOs have a huge experience and they can help local the new institutions that are emerging in the Congo. Expansion of the tripartite plus, this special requirement for the US, where I think the US have designed some processes that have been very helpful in the region. The tripartite plus one is a process that the US put into place that bring the leaders from Rwanda, Burundi, and Congo to regularly meet, share intelligence, and harmonize their security issues. That was an initiative that is extraordinary. But I'm saying this initiative needs to be expanded. It needs to be expanded to the leadership training program that the Africa program of this institution is undertaking. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because this leadership training program has been instrumental in creating cohesion among the leaders and forging a common vision in their own country. That way it reduces the likelihood for differences that are sometimes unmanageable and become violent. And then to harmonize military co cooperation in the Great Lake region. I say U.S. to harmonize this because the U.S. have strong leverage on all the actors in that particular region and also have bilateral co cooperation at the military level that needs also to be taken into consideration if peace needs to prevail to hold regular consultation with the U.S. cooperation active in the, in, in the DRC. Many of the cooperations we are talking about are other subsidiaries of the U.S. cooperations. So if you dig deep, you end up finding U.S. cooperations being involved in one way or another in the mining sector, in the forest sector, in, in the DRC. So it would be good if the government of this nation, that's a great nation, can hold regular meeting and talk about the progress this corporation are making and associating as observers other players like the World Bank and the government of, uh, of Congo. And then support of all kind, I said, for the in ongoing international conference for the Great Lake region. 
There is this process that is going, initiated by the UN and also by the Africa Union, that is bringing the countries in the region to harmonize the four areas of their development, the area of security, the area of regional integration, economic integration, the area of humanitarian assistance, and the area of good governance and democracy. So if we can get strong support, I'm saying of all kind, it does not mean necessarily money. It, it may mean also diplomatic support. It may mean presence. If the U.S. can help in that area, then we can stabilize the region and by, by collateral effect, stabilize the Congo itself and organize the, miner, the mining and the forest sector. I thank you. Thank you very much, John. I really appreciate um, such an uh, expansive presentation that really we weren't terribly fair by asking you to do both mining and forest, but I think you helped us understand how it's hard to not take those issues together. Um, Howard, why don't you uh, in some ways kick us off in terms of a discussion with a few comments of your own. Well, thanks very much. I, I want to thank John also for a very comprehensive and really, I think, useful discussion. I happen to I think his, his roadmap in terms of the recommendations makes all sorts of sense, but it's really, in, in my comments go to the question of how the heck do you make it happen? How do you get from point A to point B? Um, and, and that's in the context of the very first observation, one of the, after the, uh, that, that John made at the very beginning of his presentation, which was that violence that we see in the Congo is really a symptom of the inability of the country to manage the demands from both inside and outside of the country. And that is an observation that is really at the core of everything that is happening, including the current at the very present moment. Because the, the reality is that in the Congo, there has never been e developed uh, uh, a national political system in which the various elements of the Congo see themselves as part of the same political system, as dependent upon one another. Instead, the pervading political culture, and this is really the legacy of uh, four decades of Mobutuism, is a um, sense of a winner-take-all, uh, zero-sum game, in which uh, each is convinced, each party is convinced, that they cannot succeed uh, or prosper or even survive, except at the expense of the other guy. Um, and so all the so-called alleged progress that has been made in the Congo, and John went through the various uh, phases of the peace process, for example, from Lusaka to Sun City to uh, uh, <coughs> some of the more recent uh, developments, have come much more largely as a result of external coercion and pressure. And there is very little sense of Congolese ownership of either the institutions that have been assembled or of the uh, processes moving forward. Uh, you had the consequence of that lack of sense of ownership or lack of sense of agreement on the underlying way in which they should operate uh, and the fundamental mistrust that exists among the leaders and the absence of agreement in the rules of the game. All of that uh, came into full and dramatic view uh, the, day after, the night of the announcement of the election results of the first round elections when the two winners started, started shooting at each other. I happened to be in the Congo at that moment, and uh, it was not a very pretty sight, and, and that has only greatly compounded uh, the, the political challenges that, that lie down the way. Uh, in fact, our presence in the Congo, uh, the fact that the Wilson Center and um, our partners, um, the, um, uh, the uh, negotiations program, um, that is part of ESSEC, uh, the, uh, the business college in, in Paris. Uh, the fact that the reason we are operating in the Congo right now is precisely because at the very last moment, uh, essentially, the diplomats became very sensitive to the absence of political preparation for the transition um, and said, gee, you know, we've been so focused upon the logistical challenges of mounting an election in this, given the in incredibly fragmented uh, state of the Congo, where uh, basically Congo consists of a series of airports, there's no interconnection of roads or transportation, communications, uh, that given that logistical challenge, that became the preoccupation. But f so far over 400 million, maybe close to 500 million dollars has been invested in that enterprise. But 
there's been very little attention paid to the diplomacy, very little attention paid to the, uh, what was happening in the provinces. You have a, uh, a diplomatic corps that is based in Kinshasa, and partly because of that fact, and partly because of the difficulties of moving around the DRC, my, uh, my perception was when we went into the DRC that very little attention had been paid to what was happening in the provinces, not only in the Kivus, but also in Katanga where the, much of the mining wealth is, is concentrated. And so uh, we were just facing an enormously difficult challenge now. It is true that, I mean, I think we have had uh, some rather amazing impact in a very short space of time with the um, leaders that we, the one thing that was interesting, contrary to diplomatic expectations, though they wanted us to do this process of of a leadership training program based upon what we were doing in Burundi earlier, where the whole notion is that the fundamental problem of democracy building, the fundamental problem of peace building in divided societies is not one of an absence of democratic values or of commitment to human rights. It's literally one of the absence of a sense of national community in which people don't feel connected to one another. And the whole nature of the training program we embarked upon in Burundi a few years ago was to attempt on a targeted, selected basis, identify key leaders from all sectors, put them into a long-term training process in which you begin to um, rebuild uh, cohesion, rebuild trust, rebuild agreement and rules of the game, uh, and strengthen communications and negotiating skills so people can talk to each other in ways that will facilitate the resolution of problems rather than simply invite more confrontation. Well. We started our work in Burundi three years or two and a half years before the uh, first election, and we have, were dealing then with a country of six million. Uh, we, we didn't begin our, the work that we, in, in the Congo until January of this year in a country of 60 million. Um, and we, much contrary to the expectation of the diplomats, and this is the good news, uh, we, we discovered that all of the players from the most perceptually per perceived to be having the least political will or the least interest in this kind of process to those who are more progressive, more forward-leaning. Everyone bought in. So we have, you know, everyone from Chitsikedi and Abemba to Riberwa, Kabila, everyone bought into a, pro to a basic process, but it began so very late. And we were able to get into this initial work, key deputies of all the key players, in some cases the key players, like Riberwa, like Kamatatu and some others, um, and had such impact on some reconciliation initiatives that began on their own, springing out of this work, that the United Nations and uh, the, 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 the diplomatic community asked that we quickly move into the Kivus. And, and it, one of the reasons I think that we had such a relatively peaceful moment in the Kivus during the first round of the elections was that we have literally assembled there the key belligerent parties who are fighting over some of these, you know, these minerals, uh, among other things, um, but who have fashioned structures now to try to manage their conflicts at the local level. But, again, you don't create critical mass in, in eight months in a country of 60 million people and with this extraordinary legacy of a, of a divided political culture. So the real challenge will be, I think, less pressure on, on the Congolese to do the right thing, uh, which is sort of the thrust of where we end up with most of John's recommendations and many others, but John is sensitive to this whole issue as a conflict resolution specialist, talks about capacity building, which what he's really talking about is building for the first time a cohesion of the Congolese society and state leadership. I think it's doable. The fact that we got the kind of reaction we got was very encouraging. But I also think that we're going to be in for some very, very tough um, months and even years down the road until you can build critical mass. It's going to require a massive uh, international presence and support, not for simply pressures to do the right thing, but for processes that will enable the Congolese to begin to assume, to change the whole paradigm by which they see each other, by the way they understand their country, and, uh, and that's a different and challenging process. So let me just stop there. Well, thank you very much, Howard, for, for that in, in terms of <coughs> really bring us up to date on your efforts and how they tie in very much to John's presentation. Why don't we take some, some questions and get the, the, the audience involved in the discussion as I
indicated before, we would love for you to tell us who you are and where you're coming from, but also to use a microphone when you do it uh, to pose your question. So who would like to kick us off? The gentleman, yes, uh, microphone will be brought to you here in a second. I'm Vemba Dizolele, I'm a journalist. Um, the question for John is, I just returned from Congo where I, did, uh, I was on a reporting trip. Uh, regarding Coltan, I'm actually doing a report on that. The question I have for you is twofold. One is, I talked to people at the depot who told me, one, that the war economy was much better for them um, in Bukavu, in the Coltan and Cassiterite business in the sense that the RCD or the rebel faction provided more incentives for them. So they prefer that system to the current system. Uh, the number two point was that uh, the current mining code gives more incentive for people to smuggle Coltan and Cassiterite to Rwanda. Um, looking to this, to me it's very interesting because we know there was a time of pillaging and looting, but now they're not talking in those terms, but they're talking Rwanda and Burundi give us more incentive for us to smuggle our resources there. Could you discuss a little bit the, the discrepancies with the old mining code then today? Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, first, as I said before, um, theoretically, when you don't have institutions that guarantee you that you'll have the best of your efforts being rewarded properly, then you go to the best offer. It's so logical, I think it's the force of the market itself. Where the government is not providing the basic services for the people, when they go to the mining sector and get a dollar a day or more than a dollar a day, they feel like they are having something. They feel like they are, they, they are, their lives are being improve, improved. But the reality is, if it was organized and the taxes were perceived by the state, then the state, which is well controlled and accountable, will have given better services for them and they will not need necessarily to go and dig the, the minerals. They will send their children for, for education and there will be industries dealing with those digging and uh, the, the mining and giving the returns to the people. So I, I understand them because in a state of uh, total misery and you don't have alternative, then that becomes the alternative. And many have left going to to, to, to cultivate their, 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 their fields so that they can get food, but they prefer to go to the mining. And food insecurity has now been prevalent in the region today. Now, smuggling to, to Rwanda, this is, is, is an old story. Like the Global Witness, one of the reported Global Witness, is the same old story. If, if you take the acronym, it's SOS. It's the same old story. <laughs> in a sense that it's not only the minerals, but the coffee, tea, that is produced in the Eastern Congo is sold in Rwanda, because Rwanda provides the better uh, competitive price uh, locally. And since the government is, is not properly controlling what is inside the country, so they go mostly by s smuggling, not necessarily that they, it is allowed to go and, uh, and take that to Rwanda. Uh, the discrepancies between what Rwanda produces and, and what it exports is huge, three times, four times. This has been recorded uh, severally. What, what, what comes the difference? The difference comes from Congo, for sure, uh, because uh, they, they, gi they give better deal. Let me give you a, a story here. I was in, in, in Goma, and I was told by the people from Goma, you see these small planes, there were small chartered planes coming from the bush in Walikale and straight going to Rwanda without passing through Goma. They were taking mines and taking them to Rwanda. That was in 2003. Then the war broke out in 2004, instigated by the person who was featuring at the program yesterday on CNN. And the looting and the killing of people in Bukavu, they were kicked out from that particular area and the government started controlling the area. I went to Goma in 2004, and indeed, I didn't see more of those plans going on. Last year and this year, I went to Goma again. Those plans have resumed. So it means the government, the, those military people from the government side who are there are now again selling the same minerals to Rwanda. So 
it's the absence of the state. The state, the state does not control properly what belongs to it. It's not accountable, it's not responsible enough. That's my, my response to, to your, your question. Thanks. Ambassador Pringle down here in the front. Let, let, let Karen give you the microphone. Yeah, no, it's fine. Hi, Bob Pringle, retired uh, Foreign Service. Um, your, your answer in the whole discussion suggests maybe that the problem here is that the natural geographic facts of life is that the, uh, you know, there are no communications in the other direction, that indeed uh, this produce probably should logically be marketed uh, through, through Rwanda. Now, isn't there some way to work with the Rwandans so that those exports can follow the cheapest route? Because probably if the state tries to do it some other way, you're going to have the smuggling uh, in, in, in any case, I would think. I, I totally agree with you uh, in a sense that in terms of facilities and, and the cost of transport, it's easier to go eastwards and to go through Rwanda or Tanzania or Uganda for that matter. But what I'm saying here, they are going to Rwanda, Tanzania and the Uganda without the knowledge of the state or without proper mechanisms that will assure that revenues in form of taxes are giving back to the government. That's my point. But in terms of facilities, it's so logical that sometimes it's easier to take it that di direction rather than going to Kinshasa and going the other way around. But all in all, the country is losing in the process. And that's my point. So we need to reconstruct the country, the, the, the institution of the country. See, lady, right all the way in the back there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Uh, my name is Jackie Berger, and I'm with the Peace and Conflict Program at American University. Um, I just had a quick question regarding um, Ambassador Wolpe's remarks about Congolese cohesion, which either himself or John could address. That would be great. Um, based on this lack of national cohesion, um, all my Congolese friends that I know have a certain emotional attachment to the states and are very proud of the fact that they are Congolese. So I was wondering if perhaps this sense of cohesion does exist at the local level, but obviously not at the institutional level, um, whether that would be a fair statement to make. And also based on that, um, why have we not seen mass secessionist movements in the Congo if there is this lack of um, national cohesion? Certainly the Turis and Katanga could be economically viable states of their own. Um, so based on that, just why, why have we not seen a huge wave in the east um, and the, the southeast of secessionist movements? Thank you. That's a very valid question. In fact, I was in Geneva this year and somebody made a comment. I don't, I, I don't say his name because he heads a big organization. He made a comment and said, Congo is just ungovernable. And at the same time, he was also saying that Buru, uh, uh, Somalia, it is important that we start recognizing the state of Somaliland in Somalia and give him a particular international recognition because they have managed their own affairs much better than the rest of Somalia. I say this, these are really destructive kind of comments that he can make because people are looking forward to rebuild the state rather than destroy the state the macro state is not what we are looking for. We are looking for globalization, where the state borders are shrinking and becoming even bigger entities uh, in terms of market, in terms of communication and fluidity of movement of people. So talking about fragmentation is not the case. Now to go back to the Congo itself, I think what defines a nation is not only the power that govern the people inside the nation or a state for that matter. But it's also the attach that you have to your country. And I think Mobutu in his madness, in his kleptomania, he managed to create a Congolese spirit. During the whole war from 1996 up to now, not even the rebels at the time they were enjoying Colton uh, at the level of $20 million every month, but they didn't declare that area to be independent for the rest of the country. They remained attached to the country because the psychological attach of the country is part of the heritage 
that people have in the construction of a state. So the central government can collapse, but the spirit of the people remain, and the people remain there, and the territory will also remain in the definition, in the official definition of a state. So that's, that would be my response to you. In other words, we, the Congolese people, have been failed by their leaders. So the leadership lack cohesion, lack vision, sometimes, and most of the time, by the way. But the communities and the people inside there, as they have shown for the election, peaceful elections, where 25 million people went peacefully to an uh, election in a country that was not given that possibility. It was, it was a miracle. But it's not a miracle for Congolese, because that's their deep aspiration. But we lack the legitimacy of the leader at the leadership level whereby the leadership can match the aspiration of the people so that everybody can move across. And we expect this process of election is the one that can at least reduce the illegitimacy that we have observed at the leadership level and bring the new leaders who will kind of respond now to that deep aspiration of the communities. Can, can I just add a, just a couple of comments to that, uh, to John's observations with which I do agree. The question really points to a paradox. I mean, one of the really positive elements of the Congolese scene is indeed the sense of national identity. It's rather striking, given the contemporary history of Congo, that you have that. You've had so few tendencies towards secessionism and so on. And that's remarkable, and that's something to, that's a positive. Having said that, there is probably no society in which the political culture is one of, that is perceived with the dominant paradigm is winner-take-all, zero-sum mentality. And so that in terms of collaborative capacity, the sense that everyone has a sense of a national identity does not translate into a recognition of how, they, uh, of how each needs the other in order to strengthen their own interest. In fact, it's just the opposite. Collaboration with others is seen as risky or impossible or, deter or bound to lead to weakness rather than strength. And so it's in that sense that there's the absence of cohesion. I also would be a little bit less, uh, I, I'm, I'm not so sure I would make as sharp a distinction. I mean, it's certainly true that the Congolese political class has hardly distinguished itself by a, a cohesive vision uh, over the years. But I'm not so sure I would some, somehow put the, that political class over and against the population. Because if you look at the local level of Congo over the years, though you do have a history of very few instances of where conflict has been moved into the kind of levels of violence that we've seen uh, in recent years, uh, it's still true that you still had an awful lot of ethnic communities scattered around the country. You had everything from local land issues. I mean, if you look at what's happening in, uh, in Aturi or in the Kivus, it's not just questions of external intervention. There are also local issues that have, uh, that have been very serious underpinning some of the conflicts we, we see. So I just think there needs to be a I, mean, I think that some of these issues of how do you build cohesion, how do you build a sense of recognition of interdependence and of how people can be stronger working together apply as much at the grassroots as it does at the leadership level. Okay, Fidel, right here, and then we'll come over to... My name is Fidel from uh, Congo Civil Society. Um, my question is uh, to uh, Mr. Howard. When you talk about... Uh, the culture of uh, winner take all. Are you, do you have any specific period uh, that you are talking about or this is since uh, 1960s? Because my understanding of what you are explaining is what we are living here. You won't tell me that uh, Hal Burton belong to Democrat. <laughs> when the Republic, Republicans are, uh, uh, are leading here, they share powers among them. They share economy, any kind of dividend of winning is among Republicans. Even the appointees in some position here, the political party who win the election, share within them, among them. How this is different from Congo? Is, uh, let, let me I, I want you to be more specific on that. <laughs> let, let me suggest that America is increasingly resembling the Congo. <laughs> <laughs> I, ha I think you're, I mean, I don't challenge what you've just said. I'm not so sure that's healthy for a democracy or for, uh, or for you know, long-term uh, constructive resolution of internal conflicts. 
when, uh, when normally there are rules of the game that were supposed to be pursued. And, one, and in terms of governance, in terms of the United States system, we did have a period many years ago when, uh, back, if you go back to the, uh, the reformist era, where we had a whole political reform movement organized around the fact that we had patronage politics in which politicians were appointing uh, people who, uh, to positions based upon their political support rather than upon any notion of merit or expertise or the best bid or you know, lowest bid or anything else. Unfortunately, I think we have seen, we're going through a rough period, patch, as they say, in the United States. But that doesn't, I don't think, invalidate the broad point, which is when you get a society in which basically there are no rules of the game that are accepted, mm -hmm. and in which everyone is really basically out to feather their nest as quickly as possible for fear they won't be around a few years later and, and they want to get what they can while they can get it, that is a very dangerous psychology and a very dangerous political dynamic mm -hmm. in any society. Okay, sir. My name is Adu Otu. I'm an independent journalist. Uh, if uh, the uh, Congolese are not thinking of secession, it's because they remember 1960, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, looking at the background of uh, John Katunga, it tells me that you are more familiar, you are familiar with these um, environmental issues, not only in the uh, Great Lakes, but in other parts of Africa. Because as I sit here listening to you, I'm also thinking of the similarities in other places in Africa, such as Ghana, where I'm quite familiar with the issues. Um, would you agree that with me if I make a suggestion that uh, the African countries that produce minerals come together outside of AU to have some kind of um, an authority governing body that can um, introduce uh, or initiate um, rules and codes to be followed by, uh, because at least we know that uh, uh, Botswana uh, produces uh, diamonds without conflict. And uh, it means there are good practices somewhere that we, we can learn. Yes, um, I, I completely agree with you. Sometimes that also crossed my mind and say, why don't we have, we have OPEP, we have uh, people producing a particular uh, good coming together so that they can organize themselves and discuss on a nice kind of uh, respectful and eco footage uh, how best they can get out of their, uh, their endowment. But minerals are very versatile because as I said in the chart, they depend on international markets. So s a mineral can be today very strategic and everybody wants to rush out of it. But there's a discovery over there that makes it redundant and is completely forgotten. And so the prices may be up today and it becomes very uh, appealing to come together and organize yourself. But tomorrow the price goes down because the demands have reduced and you don't, you don't absolutely see the value of, again, coming, coming back together. So that's one of the difficulty I can see happening. But obviously, if people were well organized in Africa, not only in Africa, but elsewhere too, if those producing the same good could come together and form uh, a particular kind of uh, association so that they can deal with those who want to access those minerals and control them uh, on a more respectful and less lethal kind of uh, uh, relationship that, that is the most desirable uh, thing we c people can, can dream about. Okay. Yeah, there's a question right there, Craig, if you could help her. I'm sorry for the, and then the gentleman back there, are difficult for me to see. Thank there. you. My name is Mkawasim Charo. I'm the president of uh, the Kenyan community abroad. Um, my question deals directly with the suffering of the people in, in the Congo, with the millions of deaths and, and, uh, and rapes, they are caused directly by the, the gorillas. And they seem very well um, equipped, very well armed, very uh, well uniformed. I wonder how do they fund their operations and why isn't the combination of uh, a UN uh, peacekeeping force and uh, the Congolese government able to stop them? 
that's that's a, there's a, that's an elephantic kind of question. Um, it's huge. Um, it has been documented that women, especially rape, rape was used as a weapon of war during this war. Uh, there is even a book. Uh, I think uh, Fidel, you you have a copy of that book, that was produced and presented here at the UN. Thousands and thousands of women have been raped. The program yesterday showed it even live, the women who are in a rehabilitation center, who are being rehabilitated, who made a pathetic kind of statement. They have destroyed our body, but they will never destroy our spirit. There are so many, the AIDS is rampant. Nobody have taken stock of the magnitude of the world that we have, we have just lived. We are talking about four million, it will be more maybe in five, 10 years to come, when the AIDS develops itself. And why do people did not react? And why is it that you cannot be arrested, you cannot be taken to, to justice for what you have done? But it was pathetic yesterday in CNN, this is an American reporter, talking to a person who had been leading a systematic rape of women. And he asked that question, are you the one who did this? And he said, no, it's not me. It happened before I came. And yet it has been well documented that he's the one. He has a warrant, an international warrant on his head, but he's free. He's training people in the forest there for war. And Monique is not that far. Monique is the UN mission for, for Congo. It's not that far. It's in the neighborhood. The, um, the Congolese army is too weak to to undertake any meaningful kind of uh, result. We have the inter who have, uh, some of them, the FDLR, some of them have carried the genocide in Rwanda, or are alleged, alleged so. These are in Congo, killing people, raping women on a, almost on a daily basis. They are there, the UN is there, the Congolese army is there, nobody, nobody is taking action. So, Whose fault? There is a sense of hopelessness and helplessness that is gripping the people in the region there. They just sit there and watch what is happening. And the journalists repeatedly said it. Here you can do whatever you, you wish to do. You need just to have a gun. That's all. And that's why I'm saying reconstructing the state, especially the security apparatus, having an army that is responsible enough and equipped enough to carry out this. And I'm saying the US have a huge responsibility here because the US is friendly, even militarily, to the countries neighboring Congo from which many of these arms, uh, many of, of these trained uh, militias are having sympathy from. So I'm saying the US can help to build the Congolese army, to regionalize the security apparatus making regional rather than country-centered, rather than just focusing on one country and over-equipping that country against others, just to create a zone of security that where everybody will get benefit, where the people will all be secured, from Rwanda to Burundi, Uganda, Tanzania, everybody be secured. And I'm sure US can do that. And that's the reason I was saying uh, in my recommendations that the security apparatus is one of the areas that we need to focus on more so that we can reconstruct the Congolese state. And the Congolese state will take then the responsibility of quelling all these militia groups that are really, really playing games, in, in uh, deadly games in, the, in the Eastern Congo. There's a gentleman just to the left to the last question. Yeah. Um, I am Daniel Bondo from FES and um, Sierra Leone. Um, I have two questions and um, one is um, reducing incentive for violent conflict is one way of resolving it. Um, how, do you, how effective do you think the Kimberley process has been in um, reducing the, the incentive for smuggling diamonds outside of um, the DRC and in increasing the state's capacity to generate income from diamond? And two, looking at the conflict in, um, in the DRC and the involvement of neighboring countries, 
Why do you think discussion about the emergence of a strong sub-regional organization as like we have in, um, in ECOWAS um, is not in, uh, in the radar at the moment? We're just talking about the EU, which is itself plagued with numerous um, problems. Yeah, that, that's a very valid question. And, and for the certification of uh, all, for example, diamonds coming out of the, that has been very helpful, um, especially in resolving the conflict in Sierra Leone and, and Liberia, for that matter. And also, to some degree, uh, in, in um, Angola and Congo Brazzaville. Um, but again, you need the mining code is precisely going in that particular direction, whereby you need also to sign and adhere. And Congo is part of the Kimberley process, the Democratic Republic of Congo. But as I'm saying again, you need responsible leaders, you, re you need institutions to make sure that this is implemented properly. A lot of smuggling that is taking place is because the, the kind of uh, institution we have is powerless and the, the, the corruption that is rampant and that makes things uh, very difficult. But I agree if we control the minerals that are coming out of Congo properly, that will absolutely reduce the likelihood for predatory people to access those minerals and, and create the kind of calamities that people are suffering from. Now we are talking about the sub-region Yes, you are right. Uh, ECOWAS has been very instrumental in stabilizing West Africa. I remember uh, Sunny Abacha going to the rescue of, uh, of people, despite the fact he was a dictator in, in Nigeria, but I think he, he kind of helped a great deal in the war in the region there and bringing in his own resources and the country's resources to help the region. And today ECOWAS have created enough cohesion to respond to some of the conflicts that are happening. I remember Sao Tome Principe, there was a coup d'etat, and it took the president of, uh, of Nigeria to just talk to the, uh, the insurgents for the, normal, uh, the, 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 the president to come back to, to, to the legacy. So they are playing a good role. Now, why is it not happening in, in Eastern and Central Africa? I think it's a question of leadership. You know, Nigeria has played a big leadership role in the ECOWAS system. And also there is a wave of democracy that has gripped the West Africa, like Ghana is a country that is stabilizing. You have, you have Senegal that has a long history of uh, democracy. You have some ideal and you have structures and institutions and countries that have already some culture of coming together and the value of uh, uh, advocating for democratic principles. But in area where we are coming from, the 10 countries that constitute the Great Lake, the International, uh, the Great Lake Region Conference, according to the, the International Conference in, um, uh, designation, out of the 10, eight saw their president coming out of uh, the guns. Eight, it's only Kenya and Tanzania, even Tanzania had briefly such a case, but the other eight, they are all have this violent culture that we have. Now, if you move that, there have been a lot of effort to move away from violence and create a structure. And we have the IGAD structure. IGAD is the inter Intergovernmental Authority for Development, but that's for Eastern, Eastern countries. Then we have SADAC. And here I want to congratulate the role that South Africa has played, the South Africa Republic, so far. But this is a long ranger kind of role within the SADC countries. Uh, if they were, there, was, there was a lot of cohesion among the members of the SADC, I think they would have resolved half of the problems that we have today. But there are many dissensions among them and partisan views among them and hesitation for bold actions. So they don't, they don't act the, the way the, the ECOWAS is, is acting. Yeah, it's a pity that we have such a kind of, uh, uh, of situation, but there was a, a potential for regional bodies to come in and, and help. But another point, they are also limited uh, by the resources. IGAD have helped 
Somali to undergo the 14th conference for peace, the peace talk. That took place in Kenya. When the transition government was appointed back to Somalia, nobody came to the rescue of this transition government to solidify the peace dividend. And you saw now the collapse of, almost the collapse of the, 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 the peace talks with the new court, the Islamic court that is almost threatening the legitimacy of the transitional government because people didn't come on time to support the institution that was put into place by IGAD. So there was some weaknesses in terms of uh, resources mm -hmm. too that we can also point out there. Okay, there's a question, yeah, Keith. Uh, Keith Brown with the Jane Goodall Institute. I'd like to ask both Mr. Katunga and uh, Mr. Wolpe, this um, question on the international community and whether the international community is doing all that it can do to help the transition situation in the Congo. Is there uh, donor fatigue uh, right now relative to the, to the Congo, to the DRC? Uh, what can we expect for the future? Younger first. Um, I'm very concerned. I mean, that's a very important question. And um, I know that the diplomatic community on the ground in the Kinshasa is deeply afraid that once they get past the second election, assuming it comes off without uh, too, much pa uh, too much chaos, that everyone's going to walk away. And we have this kind of psychology, and once you have the election, that's sort of the end of the, of the, of the crisis, and now we can get back to normalcy. In, especially in the Congo, I would argue, if the election symbolizes anything, it's the beginning of a process. You will have a degree of legitimacy attached by virtue of the election. But even there, there's a question mark because uh, one of the principal forces or elements, the UDPS, uh, has basically no candidate standing uh, of a boycott that they initiated, but which I think could have been better managed diplomatically and was not managed diplomatically, so that even the, qu the legitimacy of this election process is still not going to be, uh, is going to be called into question, not only by the losers, but the people who are not even involved. And so uh, the, the real hard work begins after the election. And, um, and I would argue there's a lot of anxiety at, at all levels. One is there's tremendous pressure to reduce the size of the peacekeeping operation, the size of the Monic force. Bill Swing is doing everything he can to try to educate folks at the, in New York and around the world about the need to not make significant reductions in the Monic presence. But that Monic presence will be absolutely vital to maintain some degree of confidence and some sense of international engagement. Secondly, <clears throat> there is, I think, though we're, ge we're beginning now to see more support for the kind of capacity building work that we've been asked to do, uh, to do that properly really requires, and I think there needs to be much greater priority attached to that. There tends to be a, a tendency to immediately look at um, nuts and bolts, especially given a country that is so destitute, so lacking in infrastructure and so on. I would argue, ironically, I, I noticed uh, you were talking about the World Bank involvements earlier. In the, I think that there have been, I mean, if I had, if I could have waved the magic wand, I would have kept the World Bank out of the Congo uh, uh, during the period when they wanted to do stuff. The World Bank wants to give money out, and, I, and money is vitally needed in support of all sorts of activity. But unless you get the politics right in the Congo, all that investment will go down the tubes very quickly. And I would argue that it is, in fact, this is one instance in which conditionality is important, and that there ought to be very great caution exercised, uh, both in terms of the outlays that go forward unless it's pretty clear that you've got a government that's going to be able to manage those resources and those, uh, those inputs. And secondly, attention's got to be focused on the, on the equity of the distribution of whatever comes into the Congo from outside. Um, and there's one last point I would make, and I think it's really important, and John mentioned it, and I think it's a hugely important issue, and I think there's a role for the U.S. government and public policy to play that we don't normally talk about. He referred to the importance of working with the corporate entities that are involved in the Congo. This isn't just the Congo. This goes to the issues of oil transparency in Angola and uh, the basic issue of how do you manage resources around the world. I would love to see the United States and Western nations really step up to the plate 
and begin to do something analogous to what we did years ago in America in the passage of the Foreign Anti-Corrupt Practices Act. Well, we made it illegal for American businesses to offer bribes overseas. Um, and we were told at the time by the corporate community, look at the competitive disadvantage that we, our business people will be operating under vis-a-vis -vis the French and so on. As it relates to Foreign Corrupt Anti-Practices Act, you now have even the French uh, and others transforming their own internal codes uh, in Europe to become, that are much more coming in line with what had been American practice. Uh, but that would not have happened were it not for the American pressure on American companies to do, to do the right thing. And I do not believe for a moment that voluntary voluntarism will be sufficient in trying to get America, to use the leverage that American corporations can, it's in their interest ultimately to have responsible good governance because then they don't get ripped off, then they have a much more efficient regulatory environment on and on. But every company is always worried that if they, the, the, the responsible companies, that if they take the lead and to act responsibly and that they will be then at a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the other guy which was why we imposed a law in America as it related to bribery, which was to fat, flatly prohibit that. Um, well, I would argue, I would love to see public policy focused upon the conduct of American corporations with respect to overseas uh, exploitation of mineral resources, not only in the Congo, but across the board. And I think that would be a huge, hugely helpful input in terms of what happens after the election. Yeah, um, it's hardly to add anything else than what um, uh, Howard have just said, uh, except that um, I, I think if I put myself in the shoes of the World Bank now, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be terribly in a big dilemma. On one side, there will be that need to support a system or a country that's trying to recover. On the other side, that may also serve as an incentive for heated competition among the players in that country because money is being there. You, uh, is this saint Experi has a very good uh, say. Uh, he said, force them to build together a tower and you'll make them brothers and sisters. But if you want them to turn each other apart, throw some coins to them. A and, and then you'll see the results. I think that is it. But it's a dilemma, as I said. It's a dilemma. You leave, the country goes completely uh, haywell, but you, pu you put money inside, some stability is there, but you create, especially at a leadership level, a heated competition for access and control of the few resources. A lot of corruption is there. That's the reason why I was saying, if we put these structures, and we pray God, the structures can come, then at the parliamentary level, then we put the mechanism of control that are efficient enough and the Constitution have given us a chance to reduce the power of the nation, to not to concentrate power in Kinshasa, but to concentrate power and, and, and decentralize power and put the power in the regions, in the provinces, so people will be closer to their resources at the provincial level, whereby we have provincial pa uh, parliamentary members whose role will be precisely to know what are the resources we have for our project. Otherwise, if all goes well, five years down the line, if they didn't do anything, people will kick them out after the next round of election. So uh, I think we need support, money from the World Bank <laughs> and, and the IMF. The trouble is when that money is smuggled and, and there are loans, we are the ones we, and I'm putting myself in good people, we are the ones, the good people will be the ones to pay back the money that was taken by, uh, by looters and corrupt people. That's, that's, that's the downside of it. Yeah. That's my comment. Okay. I think there is a question right in the middle. I think we'll have to make that the, the last question before I invite you all to continue the conversation with the reception just outside these doors. Please. Hi, my name is J.R. Warner. I'm from the <coughs> Constituency for Africa. Um, you mentioned conditionality of aid and measures uh, by the international community to combat corruption and increase transparency. Is there any fear that Chinese aid that comes with no strings attached can undermine those efforts? Yes. <laughs> 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 that question for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, okay. The, the, there is something I want to expand your question and say, America should not ignore the Congo and Africa for that matter. There are three reasons for that. One, if you have weak states, weak institutions in the state, it's you open the doors for anything that can happen. Money laundering, drug dealing, terrorism movement. They power inside there. So America has, like everybody in the world today, for the war against terror, to organize this country and stabilize this country in a manner that the country becomes as responsible as it is, it can control the movement of um, this kind of uh, uh, drug dealers and, and money launderers. That, that's one, one reason why that this should be done, America should get involved. Secondly, I think America has not a moral obligation. When we talk about morality, people just close the, the, the ears. But I, America is the country that everybody looked at for democracy. Democratic system, stable institutions, an example for the world. Then if a country is struggling to become democratic, it is so logical that America should come to the rescue of uh, such a country. Just, I, I, he's, got, he's got one more point. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, 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 the third one. <laughs> you need, you need the, the third. The third one is, as I said before, most of the resources that are exploited in the Congo are becoming strategic. And it's not only America that can access them because America needs them as other people need them. And China is coming in a massive way. And China does not come the way America come or, or the way the European come with conditions, with a lot of, no, Chinese are coming physically and in what they call respectful way. So you do your game, I do my game, we are doing business. And they come physically, when I say physically, I mean it. They go to the villages, they settle. They are doing all sorts of business, including small shops in a corner. They are there, dealing with everything. And they are going to the mining sector in the Congo. And so I think if we can expand the corporations that are operating in the mining sector in the Congo and also the forest sector, you need to include all the players, including the Indians. They are also coming in a massive way. So America has a role to play again. Otherwise, other players will, will take the vacuum that has been existing after the, second, uh, after the, the Cold War. The only comment, I wanted to just add a note on this notion of conditionalities. Because I'm one who has been very, very critical of the excessive conditionality and the way in which we've handled conditionality historically around the world. Because oftentimes it has been the imposition of a specific set of our own notions about the way people should do things and comes across as very um, patronizing, very paternalistic. And at the end of the day, uh, it's a way of also blocking the development of a sense of, of, a sense of ownership uh, so that people do it. But, th but then there's the conditionality that relates simply to the fact to having the, the dollars used for the purposes for which they're being allocated. And I mean, I would argue that no taxpayer, has, I mean, it's not unrealistic for taxpayers or for financial institutions that make loans for one purpose to have those funds used for the purpose for which they're intended. And unfortunately, both because of the history and because of the absence of capacity in the Congo, the conditions to grant that kind of assurance are going to take some time to, to be developed. And I would argue that, and I, I agree, I mean, I would love to see as much forthcoming as quickly as possible that can meet the needs of the Congo, Congolese people and begin to overcome this incredible misery that they've all experienced. But, but boy, I mean, if you were to do it right now, for example, with the transitional government, uh, none of that money would have gone. I mean, most of that money would have been diverted into all sorts of other tracks. And so that, to me, is the, the, the minimum that has to be addressed. And if you don't do that, you're going to undermine the basis for the support of all foreign assistance down the road. You've, you, I mean, that's just an untenable position, I think, uh, for donors. And so I think you've got to 
uh, try to do this in a way that's much more sensitive. And, I mean, from my standpoint, you allow the Congolese to establish the priorities, to make their determinations, to make their judgments. That's for the Congolese. But the issue of ensuring that money is not diverted for corrupt purposes, uh, that I think has to be an essential ingredient of what, of what is done here. Okay. Well, I think, I think that's a, a terrific place for us to end. We're, we're right on time. I want to thank John and Howard for their excellent contributions to our greater understanding of what is obviously a complex, a complex set of issues, one that um, really does have uh, a lot of work before it as a, as a country, and, and particularly the mining and, and the forest areas, but really for uh, critically important, as you've shown, for the, for the people of Congo and for the region and, and for the world. So I, I thank you, John, for today. I also thank you for... Um, it's not quite over yet, but your tenure here at the Wilson Center, it's a, a terrific privilege for us to have many uh, distinguished people coming through our, our, um, our halls here. Um, but uh, on behalf of my colleagues in the Environmental Change and Secure Program and, and Africa and Program, program. Uh, it's just been a privilege. I wish all the fellows were, were quite, so, quite so terrific in giving and sharing of their knowledge as, as you have been, John. So it's tremendous to have had you here. So please join us in, in thanking John and Howard for today's contribution. <laughs>